There's more energy in that centimeter cube than all of the energy that you find in the universe, in the observable universe anyway. If you tap one tenth of a billionth of a percent of that energy, then it really is enough energy to run the planet for thousands of years. There is no such thing as empty space. Nothing like that has ever been found and we've looked. Like if, for instance, if you think of the largest vacuum we know of, the space between galaxies, even in that space, you find there's particles every few centimeters. So it's actually quite full. If you were to look at the quantum space, the space in the atom, for instance, where the atom is made out of 99.9999% space, so like all of your reality all of the things you call things are actually made out of space. Well, when you look at that space, it's not empty at all. It's full of energy. It's full of fluctuation, electromagnetic fluctuation. The concept of empty space really doesn't exist. And it might be hard for people to visualize. So like, let me give you an example. Like the space around you right now is full of electromagnetic fields. There's radio waves, there's microwaves, there's ultraviolet, there's infrared, there's even background radiation from the so-called Big Bang, there's radiation from the galaxy we're in, there's radiation from all kinds of different sources. And so actually the space we're in is full of energy. And we discovered these energies throughout history. We didn't know they were there earlier on. Uh, we didn't know x-rays, we didn't know ultraviolet, we didn't know all kinds of different wavelengths of energies we didn't discover until later on. And basically, we use these energies, we use these different electromagnetic waves to transmit information and to transmit power in some cases and so on. So it really is not unusual to think that there is energy in the space. Now, the difference is that this source of energy we're discussing is actually a source of energy that comes from the most fundamental fluctuation of creation. Like it's quantum fluctuation. It's energy, it's wavelengths that are so teeny, they're smaller than the atom itself. They're smaller than the nuclei of the atom. They're really teeny fluctuations in the structure of the vacuum. But because they're teeny, there's a lot of them and they're really energetic. So when you calculate how much energy there is in the quantum vacuum, in the space, in like the quantum structure or in the atom or in the proton or whatever, you find that it's huge. It's like 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube. So it's the mass of the universe is 10 to the 55 grams. So it's more than the mass or the energy of the universe in a centimeter cube of space by 39 orders of magnitude larger. So you can imagine that if you tap one tenth of a billionth of a percent, of that energy, then it really is enough energy to run the planet for thousands of years. It really is a matter of understanding that energy and understanding how to tap into it. And that actually is not that hard. We could power all of our planet for millions and millions and millions of years because there's more energy in that centimeter cube than all of the energy that you find in the universe, in the observable universe anyway. It's enormous. You could boil all the waters in the world, for instance, all of the oceans. You could boil them dry, no problem, with that centimeter cube of energy. You could melt the planet. It's enormous. And we don't need to tap all of the energy that's in a centimeter cube of space. If we have an efficiency of a billionth of a percent of what's there, we can power everything we need for eternity. And I want to mention as well, that's not just about power. It's about 
our capacity as well to manipulate or control gravitational field because with this level of power comes the capacity to curve space-time and create warp drives and so on, which that might sound really out there, but there's sections of NASA working on this right now. There is serious science being done in that field you find that many civilizations all around the world that supposedly had no contact with each other all knew about this fundamental energy at the base of creation from which all matter emerge and return. And they called it different ways. They called it chi, mana, prana, all kinds of different things. But they all talked about it they talked about it as it was very similar to a fluid. That concept eventually even made it into physics for many, many years. Uh, was called the ether. The Maxwell field equations originally were written with the concept of an ether. The ether would be the carrier of the electromagnetic waves and so on. And eventually it was replaced by space-time, by Einstein. It became a conceptual mathematical model. Uh, although Einstein agreed with it at the beginning, eventually 10 years later, he changed his opinion and, and made very clear statement that relativity, general relativity has no meaning without an ether, without this fundamental energy source. It really is uh, present in quantum physics and quantum field theory today still. It's called quantum vacuum fluctuation. So it, it actually changed names and the formalism became more obscure. It became difficult to talk about it like 30 years ago and so on. They, you know, it was almost taboo to talk about quantum vacuum fluctuations, although they were very much present in the equations of quantum field theory and were required for many different mechanism in quantum physics. The numbers are so enormous that in general, physicists said that it's either wrong or it all cancels out because all the waveform cancels out and we can ignore it. At the time, there was no physical measurement of this energy. But eventually, in the 90s, there was measurements that were done called the Casimir effect and then the dynamical Casimir effect and then other measurements that were done actually cosmologically um, and, and so on. This energy is very much there. It's very much present. And the ancient people knew about it. They knew it was the source of matter. And then I wrote physics that proves that, that supports that the, the proton, the electrons, the neutron, all these stuff actually emerge from the vacuums. It's not separate from the vacuum. Which is, a con which is a conclusion that Einstein came up with as well, is that objects are not separated from space, they're an extension of space. That, that's literally what he discussed. We're part of the space, if you'd like to think of it. And ancient people didn't only just know about it, and, and I wanna make clear that they said they got this information from very advanced gods that came to the earth and all this stuff. But as well, they knew that it had some geometric component to it, that there was some geometric uh, symbolism that you could express that actually described the workings of this energy and how it coheres, how it becomes self-organized to produce matter and the forces of nature and the constants of, the, of nature and so on. I was really intrigued on trying to like see the relationship between these symbols and advanced physics. And eventually I wrote physics that just actually recently in the paper I'm writing right now kind of linked back up to some of these ancient symbols like in an amazing way. And I, I didn't do it on purpose. It just, it, the equations just led to this and, and it unifies the forces of nature. It gives an explanation for all of matter production, including stars and galaxies and so on. Like it explains the scales 
So all scales, all forces, and all constants all unify under this geometric understanding of this fundamental structure of space. There is developments of these technologies that have been successful all around the world at different times of history, going at least all the way back to Tesla and others at the time and forward as well. There's multiple inventors and scientists that have been successful at extracting some of that energy. And I, I would even venture to say that the early tests that were successful with Uh, what was called at the time cold fusion were some of the first um, experiment that supported the extraction of this energy. Interestingly, it was poo-pooed at the time, but it was crashed by by hot fusion guys. Uh, but um, the you know currently there's international scientific meetings that are occurring in Europe that are sponsored by most of the countries in Europe in the development of that very technology, I think we're actually really, really close. Certainly, we're arriving at a place in our history where we have to transcend the way we've been producing energy and using energy. This transition is difficult, not because there's not the technological know-how, but because there is a problem with the financial and political and international, you know, military industrial complex and so on that is creating some large difficulties in, in bringing this to bear and to market. It really is up to the population and to us to like make the difference. It really is our level of interest, our level of education and understanding the transformation that this will bring to humanity. It's not just energy powering our cars and houses and all this, but this is energy that's at the base of creation, that's at the base of life itself and it can have huge impact on health uh, life extension and, and our capacity to travel in this in the universe in our solar system in our galaxy and so on it really is a critical turn very nexus point in humanity's evolution right now to bring that forward and the problem is again is not a technical Our scientific problem, it's uh, being able to overcome the inertia of earlier technologies that uh, are still hanging on to uh, continue to dominate markets. Please engage with this video by liking, commenting, and sharing. Subscribe to stay updated. For more amazing content, check out our next video.